Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. It is no secret that our part of Tennessee is becoming more and more popular. Take a look at the numbers. People are moving here at a rapid rate, but there are communities that have been around for quite a while. In Murfreesboro, there's a Laotian community that has been growing and thriving since the mid 70s. How did this come to be? What has that experience been like for elders and the next generation that has grown up here? That's coming up later this hour. But first, the midterm elections are exactly two weeks away. Early voting is already open, so make sure you get out there and vote. One of the races getting some attention is the seat to represent the people of the 7th Congressional District. In that race, Republican Congressman Mark Green is facing Democrat Odessa Kelly. Here to give us a breakdown of the race is Sam Stockard, reporter for the Tennessee Lookout. Sam. Thanks for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. Yeah, no problem, Khalil. So let's get started with the candidates. Now, Republican Congressman Mark Green has represented the 7th District since 2019. What's his history? Well, he was a state senator. Uh, Then he ran for Congress, and he almost became the Secretary of the Army until he ran into a little controversy with some of the things he said about LGBTQ community and so forth. And then he stepped away from that. And now he's making his uh, uh, bid for a third term. Okay. Now his opponent is Democrat Odessa Kelly. She was born and raised here in Nashville. And I believe this is her first time running. What is her story? Well, she had been uh, with the Metro Parks Department. Uh, Then she became a community organizer, stand for Nashville, I believe. And then uh, decided to jump in the race. From what I understand, she was advised not to, but she went for it anyway. And uh, uh, the last thing I heard, she announced that she has raised more than a million bucks. So, Mm. you know, she may not have that great a chance to win, but she's got some money. Okay, so they're both running for this seat in the 7th Congressional District, which was redrawn by the state legislature earlier this year. How do you think that will affect the race? Well, I mean, the way they've redrawn it, it's, uh, I was looking at it this morning, it's 10 to 15 points in favor of Republican. It's solid Republican ranked by all the national groups that look at these things. It's going to be really hard for Kelly to overcome those numbers. I don't care how good a campaign she runs. And she's working pretty hard, but it's going to be tough. So, I mean, both candidates, they have to really convince a wide array and a variety of people to vote for them. So... What groups are they working with? Who's Green working with? Well, Green is, he's just going for the uh, the Republican voters. He's not trying to persuade anybody because he doesn't have to persuade anybody to come over to his side. He's got the numbers already, probably 60 to 65%. Uh, Kelly, she's got to try to persuade, you know, that 10% mm. to, to vote for her. And that's what's going to make it really difficult wonder what notable endorsements they've received. Well, Green, of course, he's got uh, the endorsement of Donald Trump, and uh, Kelly's got the endorsements of a lot of the unions, and she just got the endorsements yesterday of the squad, uh, the congressional black women who are uh, widely uh, despised by a lot of the people in the the 7th District who live out in the rural areas. Mm. Well, let's talk about what sets these candidates apart. Like, what are the issues that Odessa Kelly is running on? Well, she's running on uh, the things you would think are typical for an urban black woman. Uh, She is uh, trying to get Roe v. Wade reinstated. Uh, She's running on trying to help people get higher wages, uh, better job training. Um, Green, on the other hand, is uh, he's talking about how terrible his inflation is under the Biden administration. Mm. Uh, Kelly's saying, you know, Green wants to kill Medicare and Social Security. And 
Green is just anti-vaccine. That pretty much spells it out. Those are their issues. Is there any chance of a debate happening between the two? No, not going to happen. No, not at all. Um, Green has said that. He restated it last week. Okay. Now, if Kelly were to win, she would make history as the first openly gay black congresswoman. Is this something that she's been leaning into in her campaign? When I talked to her last or two weeks ago, she didn't really, she didn't even address that. I don't know. I don't think she's going out and talking to people and saying, I'm I'm an openly gay black woman, vote for me. No, I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing that. Uh, She is definitely embracing the LGBT community when she goes to an event or something like that where it, where it is an issue such as the uh, uh, the anti-transgender thing they had at the Capitol the other night. Mm-hmm. I know she was up there backing the LGBT community, giving them support. And I think she it, it got a little testy at one point. Uh, but, you know, she's not just going out and just pushing it in everybody's face. Now you've been covering politics in this state for a while. Have you ever seen a race like this? Well, they're definitely polar opposites. Um, you've got a white guy who is about as conservative as they come, and you've got a black woman who is probably about as liberal as they get. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they are extremely different. And, and this is what happens when you get this type of gerrymandering from the state legislature that's got a big chunk of urban Nashville mixed in with extremely rural uh, Tennessee. What do you think the results, whatever they are, what do you think the results will tell us about the state and where we're headed? Well, I don't know that it's where we're headed. It's where we are. Mm. We are uh, going to have probably eight Republican congressional districts. The only Democrat will be Steve Cohen in Memphis. And it's just everything is solid red, solid Republican, because that's the way the districts are drawn. You know, you spoke of the redrawing of the districts, and, you know, Mark Green, has he commented on these new lines? Well, he did say that uh, in talking to him that he felt like they were inherently unfair, uh, and he didn't really expound upon that. He wouldn't say that. He just said he didn't feel like it should be drawn for uh, political purposes. It should be drawn for the people. And... You could take that two ways. You could take it that he doesn't doesn't like the lines because it puts a lot of urban people in his district, or you could take it because he felt like it was wrong to draw it to give a shot for someone like uh, Beth Harwell or mm. Kirk Winstead to win. Of course, Andy Ogles won the the fifth district primary, so he got it. You know, and an, another interesting aside is in that fifth. I know we're talking about the seventh, but in the fifth, if Jim Cooper had as a Democrat, had stayed in, he could probably beat Andy Ogles, mm. but he didn't. He 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 backed out, and now it's up to Heidi Campbell. We're going to see what happens here on a fortnight. Sam Stockard is a reporter at the Tennessee Lookout. You can find his story on today's episode post at thisisnashville.org. Sam, thanks for being here, and thanks for your reporting. Yeah, no problem. Enjoyed it. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn about the origins of the Laotian community in Middle Tennessee. How were they able to build a community in a new land? Are you a member of the Laotian community? Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Ikelona, and this is Nashville. Off of Old Nashville Highway in Murfreesboro, there's a temple. It's called the Wat Lao Buddharam Temple. Inside of the main building, there's a large room with a shrine with golden statues of Buddha. People gather here to sing the Buddha's praises and ask for blessings. The 
The drum comes from a time before clocks. It's a way to alert people that the temple is opening or that it's time to pray. The gong is used in many different kinds of ceremonies. The sound is a reminder that Buddha hears what we do. The monks can decide to call prayer whenever they see a need. As the monks chant, a group of people are decorating and stockpiling the temple. There are gold-colored items everywhere. There's food, pillows, buckets of money, and even a bed. These will be part of the big celebration coming up this weekend. Joining me now is the vice president of that temple in Murfreesboro, Tommy Mekulun. Tommy, welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to you. Afternoon. Uh, yeah, afternoon. It's that time. <laughs> also with us is singer Paivon Mekaloon, who is Tommy's wife. Thank you so much for being here, Paivon. Is Paivon with us? We'll see. Okay, so Tommy, we just heard a little bit of the service at the Wat Lao Buddha Ram Temple. What kind of worship happens there? Um, it's Buddha uh, temple. Uh, most um, go inside the most um, like Lao community. That's a plan. It's a big, big, huge uh, Buddha temple. How big is it? Uh, right now, almost 30 acres. 30 the, acres. The land. Wow. Now, you're pretty involved at the temple. What kind of work do you do there? I do almost everything. <laughs> okay. Because I don't want to, uh, whatever I know, whatever I know, I want to do it. And then I put my name on it. Um, when I go away, so my name's still there. Mm -hmm. I paint picture. On the wall, I paint a picture to the uh, um, inside the room, and then a big, huge uh, Buddha statue. And many things I did that, and I, I built many, many things in there to help uh, grow um, temple. How long have you been working with the temple? Since I moved into Tennessee. Since uh, 1997. So you're, you can say you're basically one of the foundations of the temple. Somebody Almost. Somebody who helped build it. Almost. That's amazing. Now, I understand that the temple is home to a variety of events for the community. Paivon, you know, what type of events happen at the temple? Well, um... Since uh, we uh, moved in here in Tennessee, nineteen ninety-seven, my husband and I, that we joined uh, uh, in a temple uh, to help them, uh, like a uh, every ceremony, every event that we try to uh, to uh, do much we can to bring the money to help and support the community uh, to to help uh, to build the temple. Mm -hmm. What's, yes. your, what's your favorite event there? What is favorite event is our Lao New Year on the on May every year. Okay, so tell me about the Lao New Year. I heard that it's probably one of the biggest events of the year. Yes, um, uh, this year is uh, my husband Tommy and I. We are the uh, president of the event, so we have. Uh, a lot of people come joy from all over United States on the Saturday night. Either we have like a like a more than ten thousand people, and uh, you know we have like a Miss Pageant, uh, seven girl, uh, and you know we have a lot of stuff going on there, and a lot of people come from all over, and you know everybody enjoy, and we have parade on the Sunday, Saturday we have like a, a choose Miss Pageant. 
you know, and we have like a three different stage, you know. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Now, what do you like about it so much? What do I like so much? Yeah, what's, uh, what's, what, what do you enjoy the most? What do I enjoy? Well, that um, I enjoy that uh, on 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 uh, Sunday that we have ceremony. We we continue to do our culture, uh, you know, uh, from what we learn from our country. That you know, this is like a you know, you know, I live I live in United States for more than forty year, and you know, this is like my country too. You know that mm -hmm. uh, we want to show the the next generation. You know to see that what's going on in our culture and and I love to have Sunday that you know they parade and they play water and everybody enjoy you know so much that's wonderful now Tommy I hear that there's a pretty big event happening mm -hmm. this weekend can you can you tell us a little about about what's about to happen yes and it, it's personal um, uh, thing to do every single year they have to select one person or group and do like of of this month only, not e either month, and they do um, we call Lao they call bun katin. That mean uh, you collect uh, stuff. The gold like you you you, you say a gold or bad everything in 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 their money. Mm -hmm. They say we believe in Buddha. If you put everything in there, when you pass away, you can collect after when you pass away. Oh, wow. So it's a ceremony where I can take money, clothing, mm -hmm. bed, possessions that I enjoy here. I offer them up in or only to receive them again in the afterlife after I die. Correct. Wow. Correct. That's what we believe. And uh got to be many people on this Sunday. And little thief and friend or that parade. Got to be new, pic uh, nice picture. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I hope the weather is good on yeah. this Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope oh, the weather's good for everybody. Question for you: What items are you going to offer for yourself? Uh, only only people go there uh, for myself and donate money. Mm -hmm. Donate money to help. That money not go nowhere. Just go to the temple. Okay. Pa they have to, that money have to pass uh, the, the monk. The monk send the messenger to do somewhere. That's what I believe. That money uh, to help build uh, our temple, mm -hmm. and 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 you know the money is money, but we believe and we receive after we die. Mm -hmm. so. Now, now, Paivan, besides prayer, how else does the temple help people? How well? Yes. Well, uh, the the temple that. Um, it's really um uh, we have like a three four five monk uh monk in in the temple you know uh you know the temple uh the, the monk work very hard that every day and every weekend that when the people pass away the funeral every weekend the, the monk do, would help would help the community would help the people to do the uh, funeral and also they not just that they they do a lot some donation to the you know uh for out to the community like for example like uh, uh past few months they have like a um, tornado or something in in uh yeah in uh, Kentucky you know the our temple donation to 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 that to their mm -hmm. uh, community mm -hmm. you know, to help out yes that's wonderful. So you guys come through and you help everybody out in the community in times of need. That's a really strong yes. foundation to have. Now, if you're just yeah. tuning in, this is Nashville and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about the foundations of the Laotian community in Middle Tennessee. Now, we really can't talk about this community without talking about Dr. John To, one member of our Lao community his name is Dr. John To, or the king of the Laotian community here. Now, Dr. John To may not be royalty officially, but he is a Rutherford County commissioner. He's also an important elder. A lot of people have turned to him over the years, especially as a translator. He's helped countless people find jobs and connect with resources. And on top of all that, he regularly appears on Murfreesboro City TV channel for a segment called Laotian Information.
สบายดีทานผู้ติดตามชมรายการภาคสลาวทําวันที่นับถือแผงที่นิสานในโทรทัศน์สองสามโอกาสภาคสลาวทุกวันคือแต่ละทิศคือภาคสาวและภาคแรงลืมแต่เวลาเก่าโมงหรือสิบโมงเป็นต้นไปและการนี้นะครับเราขอจะส่งข้อจากแผนกโทรทัศน์สองสามของเมืองบุฟเซโบของเข้าขนาดจัดกัดข่าวน้ำข่าวมาเสนอทานมิดผักสลาวเผยทานมีการเขาอกเข้าใจเกี่ยวกับข่าวและเหตุการณ์ต่างๆที่เกิดเพิ่มขืนภายในท้องถิ่นและแห่งอื่นๆอันดับต่อไปเขาเซิญทานที่ตามข่าวข้าวจากมหาชนแอมเชอร์ชิวดร John Toe first came to Murfreesboro in 1973 as a college student. He says he was the first Laotian student ever to attend MTSU. His plan was to get a degree and return to Laos, but war broke out, and it was just too dangerous for him to return. In the coming years, millions of people would flee Southeast Asia, and in 1976. The first Laotian refugees began to arrive in Middle Tennessee. It was just a few families at first, and that eventually that included Dr. John Toes. But it was enough to make the beginnings of a community. Now, Dr. John To wasn't able to join us today, but our senior producer Steve Harouche got in touch with him last week. He said that sponsoring families so that they can reunite with relatives played a huge role in growing the Laotian community in Murfreesboro. I sponsored one family, so they have brother and sister live behind. So they contact one another. The people, you know, follow that family. So that's why I have how the family built. Uh, they heard about more feasible. They heard a dance view. So that is the people say, what? How come this? And uh, you know, the time more feasible receive more refugee. Well, because of whom? Because of what? I don't want to give the credit to myself more, but because I like to give the credit to the other family to mm-hmm. extend a hand to help others. And extending a hand to help others—that feels like a theme in this community. I'm curious, Tommy, how did you hear about Murfreesboro? Um, first thing, I could not spell Murfreesboro anyway. <laughs> It's a long <laughs> way. The first time I heard Murfreesboro, uh, my my sister, she moved here first. Mm-hmm. That's an, I I know a uh, Murfreesboro. I came to visit her a um, long time ago, and and I I see that this country quiet, not like I live in back in the Rhode Island, Massachusetts. It's crowded and, and, and city and uh, many things in there. Then and, um, I make decision to move back here in 1997 and to make. Peaceful, mm-hmm. better living and and country back, country. I mean, I mean, I came from country too. That that's why I I love that weather too. Mm-hmm. Not like in, in the north of uh, country, you know, Rhode Island. I every single day we had to wake up, shovel the snow, go to work. Every uh, time and over here when the snow come. School clothes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, and the snow melts pretty quickly down yeah, pretty here quick. too. Yeah. Uh, uh, Paivon, what about you? What brought you to Tennessee? Um, well, um, back in 1986, that I came uh, uh, to the uh, big association uh, show in Nashville National Guard. There's uh, like a thousand thousand people there on the show because I am the singer, and uh, I just come and help uh, uh, do the show with them. And then in this uh, on the Saturday night after that Sunday that uh, they they take me out tour, you know, out to uh, Nashville, and they brought me out to. Uh, Murfreesboro because I have my my sister in law live here and then I love that there's a lot of back then they have a con- like a country farm like a farm corn farm and I love that farm I love that you know that's why I when I went home I tell my husband you know I we need to we need to move to Tennessee because uh, the way I live in uh, I used to live in Providence Rhode Island is I live in downtown Providence so it's very crowded and so a lot of people you know like uh, Tommy said that it's over here when I moved 1997 is very still a lot of farm in here corn farm and you know and it's very peaceful you know mm-hmm. makes you feel at home I got a question yeah. for you Paivon how did you and Tommy meet <laughs> uh, we were friends uh, in 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 Laos. 
we were friends and I, I I meet I met him and less before we moved in United States uh 1978 in in Camp Refugee. You know, we we still friends at that time, you know, and then and when when I came 1979 at uh, uh to United States and uh my mom, you know, and, and his family, you know, we we you know we know each each other, we know well. And then and then he when Tommy he at that time he leave he 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 arrived to the United States in Portland, Oregon. So we we still talk like a friend. And then my mom say, Why don't you guys get married? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was that easy, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I gotta I gotta take pointers from you. All right. So you know, we're talking about this community. Tommy, how has the community, in your sense, how has it grown here over all this time? In uh, Murfreesboro? Yeah. Um, yeah, I see that um, the building, the, the build house, it's growing fast. Like um, next to my, my neighbor, my, the way I drove to my house, used to be a farm, used to be a, a pond and everything in there. And now... The company is pop up next to the uh, uh, highway that's called Amazon Warehouse. Everything growing fast in Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of job opening. Yes, I, I I I am feeling good when people don't have job and uh, easy to 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 get the job because um, I see the email every single day. This email to me say job opening, job opening. How it is job. that? How how does that really affect and help? The Laotian community down correct, there. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Most most Laotian people uh, get uh, pay higher because they have a Nissan plant in Smyrna. Most uh, Lao people work there mm -hmm. because they pay higher. Most people uh, get a big house, new car, new purse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That 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 they they living good good life. That's good, Steve. That's good to hear. You know. Tommy, what do you want people to know about our Laotian community here? Uh, yeah, the Laotian community, we are all immigrant. We are refugee. I live in the United States. We most people came for a long time, become citizen, um, and and live a good life. But um, I hope our, our Laotian people learn uh, like like myself learning i don't i don't stop learning thing mm. i do everything and to help people to 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 do what i know that like like i do myself right now i do the uh, networking beside that that i help temple and i go uh, travel all united states and, and to help people to to uh create a uh they don't want to do a job. They can do a networking, make more money, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Paivon, you mentioned that you're a singer, but I also understand that you are a celebrity. You are the queen of Lao country music in the United States. So tell me, how did you earn this title? Um, well, I... Um... I, uh, when I was 12 years old back to my country, that my dad, he used to be a songwriter, right? Mm -hmm. And he brought me into the, to this, uh, uh, you know, um, he brought me into this part. So I, um, uh, I start at uh, 12 years old back in my country. I have recorded my song, my four song in, uh, you know, in the radio station they have everywhere in, in Laos. But, uh, when I grow up, I still continue. And when I moved into United States, 1979, and 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 two three years, I start working and you know save up to money. And 1983, I start record my first album. Uh, my first album called Nam Tamia, and um, you know it is it's everybody know this. You know, that's why I came to Nashville in 1986 to have show because uh, that song is very popular. And then I continue to album number four. Number four is the uh, name Puang Malai. That one is, uh, you know, it's blow out on over United States, everywhere in the in the world, you know? Okay. And then, um, and then like, that's 19, 
1990, I have received the name me Queen of Lao Country Music. I went to, I have received this name uh, in Canada, Montreal. I went on that show and then there's a very nice bouquet and they give me some very nice, there's all over the master songwriter there. They just come and, you know, uh, honor me on the stage and, you know, they name me uh, Lao Country Music. Yeah. Since 1990 until now, they still call me Queen of Lao Country Music in USA. Not in Laos. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's beautiful. So, but describe Lao country music for us. What does it sound like? Uh, it's Queen of Lao country music. Lao country music is not is not folk song. It's it's like a if if I compare, it's like a Do Dolly Parton. Okay. My song is like that. You know, it's country music. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. we're going to play one of your songs out on our way to break. It's called Pong Mulai Namjai. What does the song mean? Yes. What does the song mean? What's the title mean? Pong Mulai Namjai. Pong Mulai Namjai. That um, I went a lot of places everywhere I, I go that... I have uh, people that give me the, a lot of flower and a lay, like, you know, compared to when you go to Hawaii, you have lay flower on your, on your, you know, they give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I have received that a lot. And then, um, and that song I wrote for my heart to, to the audience, to all my fans all over, that I thank them, uh, you know, uh, I thank you everybody, uh, for for that uh, that the lay of flower you gave it to me, you know my song is for everybody. So I wrote that song for my heart and you know, That's and cool. album number four. All right, that is beautiful. That is local singer and queen of Lao country music, Paivan Mekulun. She was joined by Tommy Mekulun, vice president of the Wat Lao Buddha Ram Temple. Thanks to you both for being here. Here is that song. Pung Mulai Namjai by my guest Paivan Mekulun. When we come back, we'll continue our exploration of the La Laotian. La Laotian community here in Middle Tennessee with people who grew up in it. Stay with us. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Before the break, we were learning about our local Laotian community, but how did this come to be over the past 40 years? And what has it been like for the next generation of Laotian Americans growing up here in our region? Joining me now are Chai Sekunamni. He's an attorney at the Legal Aid Society and a community leader. Chi, thank you so much for joining us. Really, welcome to This Is Nashville. It's also, a pleasure to be here. So great to have you. Also with us is Sophia Lungrath. She grew up in Murfreesboro and is a board member for the nonprofit Asian Pacific Islanders Middle Tennessee, or API. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me here. Okay, now, she, I'd like to start with you. Sky. Chai, I'd like to start with you. How did you and your family come to make Tennessee your home? Um, so my parents, uh, we we settled in uh, Eureka, California at first when we first came to the U.S. And my parents wanted a better life for us. Um, you know, at the time we were living in the projects and they wanted to purchase a home and um, looking around in Eureka, which is a very small town in California, the only things that were affordable were pretty much uh, dilapidated. And so we had a neighbor who had moved to Murfreesboro a year before 
And, um, you know, he called my dad up and said, hey, there's a lot of jobs here and, you know, homes are affordable. My dad um, visited and um, just saw the opportunities that were available in Murfreesboro and decided to move us to Murfreesboro. (laughs) So we made the um, cross country trip and um, I was 13 at the time. And um, and that was in 1989. Okay, so they've been here since then. So you've been here since '89. From what you remember, can you describe what the sense of community was like when you got here? It was, um, you know, it was a, it felt like a smaller community um, in terms of the Lao community. And my parents didn't know a whole lot of people, but um, uh, they were uh, everyone was welcoming, and um, my parents are also very social people. So um, eventually they just got to know more people. And there was already a um, an, an Asian market um, in Murfreesboro. So um, that can give you an idea that there was already an established um, Lao community mm-hmm. in Murfreesboro. So it it was a, a welcoming uh, community that really, you know, even in my, um, my classes, you know, I wasn't the only Lao person there. Mm. Uh, there were many other um, Laotians who were so part a- of my class. So it sounds like you and your siblings enjoyed it when you first moved here, right? I can't say that I did because I was 13. <laughs> and moving from California to Tennessee, that was a big culture shock for me. And, you know, 13 is the middle school age where um, a lot of things, you know, not only did I have um, teenage angst, you know, Mm -hmm. coming from one part of the country, another, and then to be kind of immersed in an entirely different culture, um, not only the Lao culture, but the, you know, Tennessee culture. Yeah. So it, it was it was a big adjustment. You know, we talked earlier about the temple. How often did you and your family attend? Uh, we attended the um, usually the the major uh, events, festivals. Um, I I don't go regularly. Usually, we go when there is um, a ceremony, uh, uh, guess a, a celebration for a deceased family member. Uh, Sometimes when someone passes away, you know, to honor that family member, the family will uh, do a uh, ev- event where they will invite people over and give donations to the temple in honor of the person who passed away. And then, of course, there's the uh, the New Year Festival that happens at the end of May. Mm-hmm. Uh, we go to that pretty uh, pretty regularly. Sounds like a great time. I need to go now. But I, I do. Yeah, go. you do. Lots of good food. Okay. Okay. We're going to mark it next May. I am there. Sophia, tell me, what is the temple's importance in the Laotian community? Growing up, um, it was always a place that my family, uh, I've gone weekly. My aunt, Mithui, she goes to both temples, Um every Sunday or every chance that she gets. And it was kind of our sense of community. Uh, I was very, I was born and raised here. So I wasn't there when the temple was just starting out. Um, So it's kind of cool just to see the plaques on the wall, um, what Tommy was talking about and having his name there. And uh, my family's last name is one of those plaques. So um, it's a community center in a way for us. And it's where we gather together as a community. So it's very important. Do you Did you feel a strong connection to your Laotian heritage as you were growing up? Both of my parents are Laotian, so I, I did in a way. Um, but in a way, also, I also felt very uh, kind of disconnected. Mm. There are certain um, ceremonies that I know that we do every year, but I don't really know um, kind of the true meaning of what we are doing and certain actions and what we are doing. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, um, growing up in the community, my family was, I mean, my mom and dad were also very social. So, um, I was always surrounded by other, um, Laotian and Thai kids growing up. 
I, I ask a question of both of you because, you know, we just met, met, met Tommy and his wife. Are a lot of the elders in the Laotian community pretty social? Because I just picked up a wonderful social vibe from them. Would you say yes. so? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 so a lot of the culture is about getting together, celebrating, honoring, eating, drinking, and being festive with each other. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's really, 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 really beautiful. Now, if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about our Laotian community here in Middle Tennessee with Sophia Lungrath and Chai Sekunamni. Now, you know, Sophia, when you talk about that, when you talk with the elders, what have they said to you about how this community got started? Um, I had a really great conversation with Chanto and um, Shai, who is an NP in Murfreesboro. And, you know, Chanto kind of just talked to me about their building blocks in the sense of, you know, certain things they've had to do. Um, and kind of how it was back then when it came to like getting people in jobs, especially in Murfreesboro and how much it's kind of bloom over the years um, before I was even born. But, you know, when they do talk about it, they, they make a huge emphasis on what it looks like or how they would like to kind of pipeline what they've built to um, a younger generation. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what our conversation looks like. Was it difficult for them to establish the foundations that they did? Um, from my knowledge, I'm not sure. Um, I think Chanteau did say there was some difficulty just because of, like, translation when it came to talking to, like, city officials, um, even understanding the process of, like, buying the land and starting to build that and, you know, what are the... what are certain um, things they have to go through, et cetera. So I can imagine, um, yes, um, but they got through it. So, yeah. I wonder, do you have an idea of what the process is like for helping a new family get acclimated into a new country and culture? I know there has been a huge um, influx of uh, refugees coming from Burma. And um, I know there is, I know there was a call of action for our community to kind of help them um, you know, when they came over, Chanto made a huge emphasis of families reuni- reuniting mm-hmm. or um, like Tommy, you know, he came over because of a family member was also over here. So it's kind of connecting and being able to um, kind of find your family who's already here and ha- have been established and um, helping, you know, helping that those who come along to also do the same. Now, now, Chai, did your family, did your parents enco- encourage you to hold on to the culture? Well, they did. Um, and, you know, they tried to uh, teach me and instill in me um, the culture and tried to make me um, speak loud. But unfortunately, um, <laughs> you know, there's always that rebellious side where, you know, you kind of turn away um, from their culture for some time uh, to try to fit in into the American culture as a whole. And so I'm, I find that as an adult, I'm, I'm going back and trying to learn more about my culture. And like Sophia said, you know, a lot of the, um, the festivals and things that we do um, don't entirely make sense. Um, and uh, sometimes the ceremonies are done in another language, not even Lao. So it's hard to kind of figure out what's the meaning of this. And so I'm going back and trying to learn all of that. But, you know, my parents would speak to me in Lao and I would respond back to them in English. Mm. And it wasn't until I got married that, um, you know, I started speaking Lao more. Now, I understand that Lao has a formal tense and an informal tense. Yes. So when you speak to elders, you refer to yourself in one way. And, um, you know, you use different terms, you're more formal. And when you speak to a colleague or a friend, you um, use a different set of words, I guess. And um, I never learned how to speak informally. Mm -hmm. And so when I speak loud, it always comes out as if I'm speaking to an elder. And so it's, it's never, 
it's not comfortable to converse in Laos because I, you know, have that insecurity of I'm not using the right uh, format. Mm-hmm. I can imagine if you're talking to your friends and everyone's like, why is Chai so stiff? <laughs> yeah, I, we're right. the same age. <laughs> yeah, that's something. Now, Sophia, does what Chai saying, does that resonate with you at all? Uh, it does. Um, I'm the youngest out of all my cousins. So obviously those who are older than me can speak it way better than I can. Um, I can more so understand it better than be able to speak it. Um, so I was never able to kind of get the hold of, you know, informal and formal, um, way on how to speak. Wow. Yeah. What was school like for you? School was, um, so growing up and Um, I kind of, we, we talk about this in my group of friends, uh, we were all put in ESL, um, Mm. even though English was our first language, which was crazy because we were like, how did you get here? Or, um, you know, I, I, again, I responded back to my family in English, um, most of the time. So growing up was, um, kind of weird and difficult. I'm at an age where, um, I don't feel like, you know, am I being, am I too, you know, am I being too Asian or am I being too American? Mm. Um, so I'm kind of caught in the in-between um, where I don't know if I'm too much of something, whether, you know, t- depending on the environment that I'm in. Mm. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's pretty wild. Now, you know, I'm just under wondering about, you know, some of the challenges that you faced, Chai, when you were in school. I think I had a lot of that struggle of um, trying to find where I fit in, especially um, growing up in the 80s and 90s. You know, there's uh, people really didn't know a lot about um, the Lao community or different communities in general and, um, you know, our different foods and all of that. And so trying to make myself fit in by trying to be more Americanized, um, that was the struggle of, you know, trying to stay within the culture, but yet at school, you wanted to make sure that you fit in, you wanted to be like everyone. Mm-hmm. And that was a struggle. Academically, I I was fine. Um, school was all I did. <laughs> and because I wasn't allowed to do anything else. Um, so it became kind of my focus and um, my drive. Mm-hmm. Now, Sophia, real quick, about 30 seconds. What do you want people to know about the Laotian community here in Tennessee? That we're here. Um, I did a huge census campaign with a few grassroots um, nonprofits to just, you know, talk to our community to be statistically here. Um, Because then that shows that we're physically here as well. And I would like to just, you know, tell people that, you know, our community is growing and I get really excited whenever, you know, we see new businesses pop up that are, you know, Leo Chanon or Thai owned. So Mm -hmm. yeah, really excited. All right. We, that is Sophia Lungrath. She was joined by Chai Sekunamni with the Legal Aid Society. I want to thank you both for coming on to the show. We're going to go out with a song from Laotian musician Ketsana Vailelak, who recorded her own version of a Lao song from the 1960s. The English title of her version is Forget Lao's Not. Let's check it out. No matter where I am, near or far, my loved ones, my family, my relatives, my friends. Bo lum viang chan, lum mang lao bo dai, you will always be in my heart.
We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutto. Shout out to our intern, Tori Hoover, and the masterminds behind our theme music, Laurent and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Joseph Gutierrez, Alan Bozeman, and Nina Cardona. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other. Oh, man,